Are you asked to generate reports for your company's data? Has someone suggested that you buy or deploy massive BI software that's expensive, closed source, and generally underwhelming? Well, it's Redash and Python to the rescue. Today you'll meet Eric Framovich, the creator of Redash, whose goal is to make your company data-driven by connecting to any data source to easily visualize your data. Not only is it a cool open source, but it's an example of someone taking a successful open source project and building a business on top of it. This is Talk Python to Me, episode 110, recorded April 27th, 2017. I'm a developer, in many senses of the word, because I make these applications, but I also use these verbs to make this music. I construct it line by line, just like when I'm coding another software design. In both cases, it's about design patterns. Anyone can get the job done. It's the execution that matters. I have many interests. Sometimes it can Welcome to Talk Python to Me, a weekly podcast on Python, the language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. This episode has been brought to you by Intel and Hired. Be sure to check out what they're offering during their segments. It helps support the show. Eric, welcome to Talk Python. Oh, good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. It's time to democratize some data and, and break it free from all the places it's captured and uh, use Python to do it, right? Yep, 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 yep. That's how it started. And that's the, it's still the mission. Like, uh, we're not there yet. And it's a lot beyond the technology itself. It's also educating people. But yeah, that's the goal. Yeah, it's, it's an awesome goal. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you about it. But before we get into that, let's hear your story. How did you get into programming in Python? It started over 20 years, 20 years ago uh, when I got my first PC, which was an XT computer. I think that there were newer computers at the time, but that's what we could afford. And as a kid, there wasn't much to do with it. So I started exploring and luckily stum- stumbled at QBasic, which was shipped with uh, DOS at the time. And it had a few example programs and games along with it. So basically, I just started running them and then uh, messing around with the source code and looking what what results my changes have been causing. So that was my first start uh, with programming. Later, I found uh, some older kid at, the, at school who was programming during breaks. And I was like standing behind him, looking over his shoulder, looking what he's doing catching up new functions and stuff, and then going back home to try it. And eventually my, my parents bought me some books and that's uh, how I really started programming. From them, I kept learning, you know, started connecting to the internet, exploring more. And I think that I got a bit into web development at the time. And then the biggest jump was when I was 18, we have a mandatory army service. I was lucky to join uh, one of our intelligence, military intelligence units, where I was became a developer. And there I was doing stuff that are completely different from what I'm doing today. A lot of C++ and hardware interfaces. Gained a lot of interesting experiences, like debugging on a helicopter. Debugging on a helicopter. How, how interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not, I can't share that much details, but yeah, that's, <laughs> that happened. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> When I finished my army service, I got back into the web and web stuff. Um, although I had the chance to do pretty much everything like full stack and mobile development, like native mobile development and anything, whatever the, the job requires. Yeah, so, and Python, I think that I started with Python. I'm not really sure, but I th- definitely I start, I've been doing Python when Google App Engine was released. So that's around 2008. I had some detour in Ruby for a few years, but then four years ago when I joined Everything Me, I went back to developing mainly in Python. Um, been doing some Go in the past years, but there's nothing like Python. Yeah, that's right. And okay, so this is interesting. You talked about what was it called? Everything Me? What, yeah, what, yeah. Yeah, so for a while you worked at this company called Everything Me. And that was like a launcher app for Android phones. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And that was super popular, right? Like between 10 and 50 million downloads or something on that scale? Yeah, something like that. That Yeah, that was the scale. I don't remember the exact numbers by now, but yeah, that was the scale. Were you guys using Python there or was that mostly just things like Swift and Objective-C or not Objective-C, Java? 
I guess. So yeah, it, our client was Android only. So that's Java. But we had a lot of, because probably today we would call it AI-based launcher or whatever uh, the current buzzwords are, but it was personalized and it was learning you over time and adapting to you, I mean, in various ways in the UI. So there was a lot of machine learning and, and logic on the back end. And most of it was in Python. Our Some of our new code was in Go, but I had, like, I was doing many Python. And then that shut down, which is actually a really cool story, which we'll get to in a minute, which kind of gave you uh, an excuse to do something even more cool. And But it seems like they came back. Is that right? The application itself had come back. It was a bit uh, weird for us. But yeah, there was another company that bought the IP, I think, or something like that. I'm not really sure about the details, but they brought back the app. Yeah, because I, I read your... Medium post about how when that shut down, you went to work on this project, and then I did some research to look at just what that was historically. And I'm like, oh wait, it's still in the Play Store, and there's still an active website. And okay, I, must, I figured somebody must have purchased it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well that brings us to what you're doing today. So what are you doing to day to day for programming? These days, I'm working on Redash, and I'm working on the three levels. One is Redash itself, so the code trying to build the Redish community because it's an open source project. So trying to build the open source community around it. But it also the company that I started when everything me was shut down. So we're also trying to build the company. And yeah, so that's my day to day. And I'm trying to balance between all of this. Usually one of the aspects is suffering more than others. But I'm trying to learn over time how to improve the balance. That's really cool. So one of the things I'm always love to talk about and share with everybody is how people have an open source project and how they in some way or another make a business about it. So I really want to dig into that. But before we do, let's talk about just Redash itself. What is Redash? Where did it come from? Things like that. Okay, cool. So there for me, it's when like at some point, when we started, we collected event data, like about usage and stuff like that with Splunk. You can compare it to Elasticsearch with Kibana, something like that. And once we started getting actual usage, it just didn't scale well with the amount of data that we started to collect. And we've been looking into different uh, alternatives and decided to go with Redshift at the time. It was really around the time that Redshift was just introduced. It was a bit over four years ago, I think. All right, tell us all what Redshift is from AWS, right? Yeah, so basically it was a mobile app, but you can compare it to Google Analytics, like the data that Google Analytics collects. So it's the same thing, like a user clicked this button, user swipe left, user swipe right, user did that, looked at that, and stuff like that. And for us, it was really important because along with Splunk, we've been using Flurry, I think, and some of the -the off-the-shelf analytics products, but most of them really didn't work for us because We've been creating quite a unique product. Like it's it's a launcher, so it's not an application that you start, do something, and then close it. It's something that runs all the time. So the concept of session is completely different from how other apps see it or how the off-the-shelf products see it. So being able to access the raw data gives us a lot of power and ability to really understand what people are doing. So that was Redshift. So you said Redshift is a column store database column yeah column yeah which is not necessarily the same as a standard relational database it's not a document or key value store type of database yes how would you describe that like what does it mean to be a column or database redshift has two properties one of them is that it's columnar and what it means is quite easy to understand is that it stores data in columns so when you write a row it takes each column and stores them each one of them along with the other values of that column. And what it allows, it allows for easier compression. Like it can really compress your data really well because think of like, if you have a column which is a Boolean, so it's super easy to compress it if you have only these Booleans versus if you store them by rows because then it gets harder to like to compress this row because it has all these different kinds of data. and. This compression both is, saves you space, and when you're dealing with large, large amount of data, it's important. But it also makes processing much, much faster because you need to to load 
smaller amounts of data each time. The other property of Redshift is it, it's, I think the term is MPP, is uh, massively parallel, what's the other P? I don't remember. <laughs> massively parallel, that's just MPP. So why MPP? Massively parallel processing, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. They have, they, like when you run a query on Redshift, they compile binary code from it, from your query, distribute this code to all the nodes in your cluster. And then each node runs the query and then the master node aggregates it all. So it's all sophisticated ways to process large amounts of data. That's cool when you're processing large amounts of data. It's not cool when you have small tables because then the penalty of like waiting for the compilation step and all that is like it's too high compared to if you just ran this query on a normal database. So you need to know when you should use it and when not, but it's a great tool. If you like on, on the Google side, you have BigQuery, which is again a columnar database, but BigQuery has the advantage that it's, you might call it serverless, because with Redshift, you need to decide what the size of cluster you have. You need to, to maintain it. You need to vacuum your data like you do with Postgres. With BigQuery, you don't have all this hassle. You just load data into it, run your queries. You don't worry about anything. Google takes care of it. It comes with the downside that you pay per query. They have an interesting pricing model where you need to pay basically based on the amount of data that your query is scanning. So you need to be really aware what your query is doing and what columns you're picking to query and stuff like that. That is an interesting business model to like, as your code runs less efficiently, you pay more, but that's a pretty straightforward way to, I mean, that's how you yes. use it up, right? Yeah, so. exactly. And the thing is that while it's not straightforward this way, with Redshift, it's practically the same because if you write a bad query, you're waiting longer time, you take more resources of your cluster, so you will end up eventually having to buy a larger cluster, so it means it costs you more. It costs you in human hours, like when your analyst is staring at the screen and waiting for his query to return. So it's less explicit, but it's practically the same thing. But obviously, from financial standpoint, it's much easier to say, okay, we have this and that budget. That's the kind of cluster that we're going to buy, and that's it, versus BigQuery, where you, okay, I'm not sure how much it's going to cost me. Let's hope it will be okay. Yeah, it's definitely harder to predict, but uh, okay, very, very interesting. All right, so you you said, look, we have this this high-performance, massive-scale database, and sort of regardless of which one you choose, and we have all this data coming in, and you're like, well, now we want to look at it and query it and do reports on it and things like that, right? Yes, exactly. So we adopted, we, we had this project of, okay, let's start piping our data into Redshift and to understand how we should do it and all that. And when we started to get to the finish point of this, we said, okay, we're starting to have data in Redshift. What are we going to do with it? And we've been really spoiled by Splunk because Splunk has a really good user interface that allows you to query the data that you send into it. And they have their own language that some people like it, some others not. I didn't use it enough to form an opinion, but it was obviously lacking with Redshift because Redshift is just a database. They don't handle the UI. And at this point, we we decided, okay, let's, let's look at what uh, the big boys are using. Let's find the BI tool. And we looked at Tableau, Yellowfin, and maybe some others, but all of them failed with Redshift. They might be great tools for traditional BI, let's call it, but with Redshift, what, what we've been doing at the time, and probably many others doing, we had a huge table, which being our raw events data, and we wanted to start running queries on top of it. And it's something that's super hard to do with tools like Tableau or Yellowfin. I think that they improved over the years and adapted to support better tools, uh, databases like Redshift. But it's definitely not the same thing as being able just to open an editor, write your query, and run it on top of the results, uh, on top of the table. We try to find a tool. At the same time, because we started already collecting data. Anyone who wanted access to this data, we just created a user in Redshift, told him to connect with any SQL client that he likes, and they started people started querying for data. 
getting results and sharing them. But the way they've been sharing them is basically sending CSV or Excel files over email, <laughs> which is okay. But then you get into questions like, Okay, we see an issue in the data. Okay, we see that we have a drop in conversion. Now start, we start with questions like, do we really have an issue? Maybe the issue is with the data that we collect because we, it's a new pipeline. Maybe we have a bug and it's not really a drop in conversion. Or maybe it's just the way the person who wrote this query, he made a mistake and he calculated the conversion wrong. So you start reverse engineering the kind of query that he ran because he obviously since then closed his editor. He doesn't remember what he did. He just has a CSV file to show. And it was really, really frustrating. I'm sure. And you can't even verify it this, some of the times, right? Because the person might not remember exactly what they did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and this yeah. is like an exact true story where I was reverse engineering. I knew what query that person started with. So I started with that query and I'm running it and I see, no, that's not the same numbers. Okay, let's change this and that, not the same numbers. And then I followed the steps until I got the same numbers and okay, he had a mistake in the query. And this is not something like, I had a similar experience in the previous working place. So the problem felt familiar. And me and our CTO at the time, Joyce Simchon, we started talking about how about if we had a JS Fiddle-like UI for queries, where a person can write a query, get the results, and then share this URL with others, where he gets, where the other person gets both the results, but also the query, so that you can see what he did, and maybe understand if there, if it's like, do some peer review, and also, if you want to keep digging in, you have the query to start with. So, we had this idea floating. And then we had one of our hackathons, and this is when Redish was born. Nice. Yeah, you know you have a, a, a good product or, or idea when it's solving a problem that keeps coming back, right? You're like, oh, we've been here before. Why is there nothing that actually does this well? Yeah, yeah. And I think that only after I realized, yeah, that's actually something that I wanted to build back then. Hmm, interesting. And many people that adopted Redish since then, been telling me, yeah, we build the same thing internally, but we dropped it for readers because, well, we can't really maintain it for a long term. And here's a product that someone is already maintaining and using. So let's switch to it. Right. So Redash kind of is made up of two different parts. You've got, like you said, this JS Fiddle like query editor. And it's actually really nice. It has auto completion for the columns and tables and all sorts of stuff, right? Yep. It depends on the database that you connect to, because not all of them we have support for loading the schema. But if it's a connector that supports loading the schema, you will have autocomplete. And we have some other features that we adopted over time, like query snippets. And you can have parameters inside your query, so you can create something more interactive that the end user, let's call it, can play with instead of changing the query every time. I see. So can you have like a, so the other half of the story is you build the queries. The other half is the dashboards and visualizations. So on your visualization, could you have like a slider that is like a number of days you want to average across or something like that? And you can slide it and it'll change the query. So unfortunately, the parameters are not as slick as a slider or something today. So currently they're just input boxes where you can, the most that you can customize is like, say, okay, this is a number input box, or it's a date input box, and the UI will adapt accordingly. But it's definitely an area where I and hopefully others uh, want to invest more and improve it, because eventually not everyone knows to write queries. And having the need to have someone to write a query for you every for every small change is not fun. So being able to give these people a way to create interactive stuff is super important. Sure. And being the person who writes that query where they're like, well, I asked for, for one day, but now could you do it for seven days? You know, that's also not fun to be doing that, right? Yeah, exactly. Although I've seen more than once that people who are not like your traditional, someone who like, obviously developers will know to write queries. Then there are the product managers who some of them had some engineering background, they know to write queries. But I've seen marketing people learn to write queries just because, well, they started with asking someone to write a query for them. And then over time, they started picking at, at the SQL and saying, okay, that's not that frightening. Let's change the number of days from 7 to 14, running the query, and hey, I got 
got the results I wanted. That's cool. And then the next step is that they, okay, let's just learn SQL. And there are some good resources online to learn SQL. They learn SQL, then they feel really empowered because now they can have direct access to the data without anyone in the middle. It creates some issues sometimes because many times the companies, organizations actually, won't have a clear schema of the data. The data model is not that obvious. Especially on these event streams, right? Where you're just like dropping data in that's streaming in or something. So yeah, so the event stream is definitely hard because it's also harder to like every question beyond like, okay, how many events we had yesterday? How many unique users and obvious stuff like that becomes really complex query. So this is something that I really want to tackle in the future and basically to make it easier to create more sensible models around the data. And I have some ideas here, but that's, it will take time to get here. But yeah, so, so it's not that obvious to give people a way to play with data, but I think that the fact that in Redash you can always see the query and always have some peer review, it makes it much more safe, let's call it, to do it. And I've seen really good success stories around this. Yeah, and you have the ability to very much JS Fiddle-like to share your queries and you know save them in the dashboard and then people can like fork them off and say okay i'm gonna make a copy of this and then i'll tweak it myself and save my version and stuff like that right so that's pretty helpful yeah so basically the flow is that you can write the query get the results from here you can just share the table that you got that's cool you can access it with an api if you want to connect it to, to some other tool but you can also visualize it. And there are several types of visualizations. The default ones are like charts, maps, some Sunkey, world cloud, and other stuff. And then you can group several visualizations into a dashboard. And that's shareable as well. That's basically the scope of it. Yeah, that's cool. And so really, I think, you know, the way people probably perceive it is like, here's a, a site internally we can go to, or I guess it could be public as well, that we can go to and it'll show us the stats for our company. If we've got an app or a web app, how are people using it? If you got sales, like what sales versus leads doing, right? And there's a lot of different ways to visualize it. One of the things I saw that you guys had that I really appreciated because I've had to build it before is cohort analysis, <laughs> for like subscription services or, you know, those, those types of things, you know, users come and then they fade out. And that was really nice. So you have a lot of nice visualizations and they're pretty interactive and they look really good. There, there are certainly things like you would be happy to put in front of the CEOs or whatever and go, here's your dashboard. Enjoy this. In many cases, the CEO is the most active user in Redash. Like at everything me, usually the CEO was the one to spot data issues because he was like, all the time on Redish and he would spot various changes in data. And we had, because we've been using Redshift from the early days, so we had cases where a data for a whole day just disappears and then reappears. So he was spotting that just before anyone else. Not sure. I live in this. I know this looks weird. <laughs> I've been watching this for four, 14 days. Yeah, so he was really challenging us to build a better alerting and monitoring mechanism for our data flow so that we can spot it before him. But I know that other companies as well, like the most active user is the CEO and he's like starting his morning, checking from the phone, the stats, and then goes to email. So yeah, it's really, it's really nice in that way. And, and really like the visualization is something that we really want to find a way to get more contributions from the community. Because this is like a venue for people to really become creative and share stuff that they know. And I think that something that really will really help with it is if we will have some plugin model. So today you need, like, if you want to add a visualization, you need to make a pull request to the main repository. And you need, like, to start the whole project for that, which over time became a bit hard. So I think that once we have a plugin model, it might catalyze more development around this area. Yeah, I was thinking that a plugin model, uh, I was going to ask you about that. That seems like a really good idea. We all love Python for its tremendous productivity benefits, but getting the best performance takes some work. What if you could get out-of-the-box, easy access to high-performance Python? 
Intel distribution for Python developers delivers just that. Get close to 100 times better performance for certain functions when using NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, linked with the optimized native libraries like Intel Math Kernel Library, access efficient multi-threading, and Python projects like Numba and Scython. Try the Intel distribution for Python and experience performance today at talkpython.fm slash intel. And profile your Python and native C, C++ applications for performance hotspots with Intel VTune Amplifier. With Intel, it's all about performance. We also talked about the community. Like if you check out the, the GitHub repo at github.com slash get redash slash redash. And when somebody, one of my listeners suggested that I have you on the show and that we talk about this, I'm like, okay, this is a pretty cool looking project, but like how many people really care about it? And then I went and looked at the GitHub repo and there's like 65, almost 6,500 stars. There's like 135 contributors. I'm like, whoa, people are using this a lot. And it, it, it seems like such a nice alternative to like Microsoft Excel with like some BI plugin or, you know, something like that. Or all, all, the, all the various like big corporate commercial things that you have to buy into to sort of do your BI dashboard type stuff. Yeah. And most of them are many times will be too complex for many use cases and overpriced. So basically, they've been like priced. Let's buy. Let's charge as much as we can, which is not really friendly for smaller companies or for different economies. Like Redish has users really all around the world, and we see like people from Asia, Africa, South America, where they have a completely different economy, and it's really hard for them to afford all the other tools. So being able to like to give them something that's really affordable, like almost free, like it's open source. So it's really free, except for the, I don't know, the cost of the server really gives them, uh, I don't know, uh, the same playing field as others, which is kind of cool. We have like, besides that, we have all the big names that use it and that everyone knows, like Amazon Atlassian, Mozilla, SoundCloud, Outbrain and others. But it's really cool for me that I know that it's being used everywhere and not just you know, like in the United States, in the Silicon Valley. And actually, I think that in the Silicon Valley, probably less popular in many other areas. Right, because they have the money to burn on whatever they want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is cool. It's cool that it's used at some of these major tech companies. It's also cool that it's enabling places where they're just with nothing possible or much less possible before. So you talked about supporting different databases or connectors you actually have a quite a few integrations you call them what are some of the integrations that you guys have we started with this for redshift and postgres and basically it's the same thing it's used like redshift you can talk to it with the postgres client so this was the first connector that we had i think the second one was mysql and the third one was bigquery but since then we had many more and most of them came from as contributions from the community. Basically, someone found Redash, he wanted to connect it to his database and he created the connector. And I think it's, there are two reasons why it became like this kind of contribution became popular is because there is a really simple API that you need to implement to add a connector to Redash. And also it's like the thing that you must create to be able to connect to a database. So it's been really motivating people to do it. So yeah, today it connects to many databases I never used or heard of before. <laughs> like InfluxDB or Impala? And the... uh, so actually InfluxDB I used. Okay. <laughs> but, but Impala, yeah, I never like. Yeah, yeah, cool. And also it connects to like the standard the sort of big company ones like Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server. You've got yeah. um, MongoDB and uh, MySQL, like what you already mentioned, and, and Cassandra and some others, right? Yeah, and with... All of them, you can say, well, let's say with all the SQL ones, you can just write the regular SQL query that you will write for the database. Like we don't do any processing on your query. We send it as is. And this is one decision, decision that allows us to support all these databases so easily because adding a database is just a matter of having a proper driver in Python for it. And even that, not really a limitation as like Amazon Athena, which is something they introduced recently. They released only a JDBC connector for it. And basically, 
what I did is write a simple microservice in Java that uses the J- J- JDBC driver and exposes an interface that readers can talk to it. I see. But most of the others, we just use the Python driver. Now, if it's a database, if it's not like, if it's a database like MongoDB, then you just need to write a JSON that describes the query, the, the MongoDB query. And it's almost similar to the syntax that you might use if you wrote the query inside some Mongo shell, not exactly the same, but quite similar. But we also use this for other, like we have connector to Google Analytics, for example. So you, again, you write a JSON that, that describes the data that you want to fetch from Google Analytics, and you can get it into Redish. Similarly, we have support for Google Spreadsheets, Jira, um, and some other stuff. And what this allows is that you can create one dashboard that shows data from the multiple data sources that you have. It became quite common these days that many companies will have different type of data sources, and it really helps them to be able to just show data from all of them instead of having different silos of UIs that show data from each one or having to build it in-house yourself. Right. So maybe you could have like Google Analytics, like a Google Analytics widget on your dashboard right next to, so for web traffic and conversions, uh, right next to like your sales numbers for the day. And you could see how those relate potentially or something like that, right? Yep. 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 Nice. Do you have integration with things like Stripe? No. And it's something that comes up and maybe in the future we will have, but it's much easier today to just use something like, um, I don't know, Segment or Stitch, which are companies that give you the service of, you connect all these webhooks to them, or they just use their REST API, whatever, and they can uh, write the data into your database or maybe BigQuery or whatever you you want, and then it's easy to query that in Redish. I see. Let them handle all the API bits and the callbacks. It's not only that. You get also the advantage that you have all the data in one database, so you can start joining the data easily. Right. Okay. And it's something that you can do in the hosted version of Redish, that you can write a query that runs across different data sources, but it's still not the same thing as having it in the same database and easily manipulating the data. Sure. So we've talked about a lot of the databases and data sources on the back end. What is Redash itself built in? It's a Python web app, right? Yep, yep. So it's both Python and JavaScript because all it's single page application. I think there are new names for that today, but basically the Python side is, is an API. And then there is the front end application that uses this API to present the UI. I see. So you've got like a Flask backend. There's a bunch of JSON services. And then you've got, what, Angular running on the front end? It's a bit embarrassing these days to say it, but yeah, we're using Angular 1. So yeah, when we started, it was quite new and fun. But uh, these days, yeah. Isn't that the problem with JavaScript? It's like, we got the most amazing thing. It's just taking off. And like six months later, it's not, right? There's yeah. five other choices. It's hard to really pick a winner. I mean, it's just nobody seems to reign very long in that, that world. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit frustrating in this sense. Ember been quite surprising in the sense that they kept just moving ahead. And there are they've been able like to really pick up the good parts of each new iteration of frameworks, but it has its own issues in other senses, but it was really impressive to see how Ember just evolved over the years. And I think that there is a feeling that things starting to stabilize, that the community starting to adopt less like the same tools and start to evolve them instead of, yeah, let's reinvent it again. And it seems that React is going to be among the top winners alongside with Wu. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's V-U-E. Okay. And probably Angular will stay because all the enterprise uh, players that use it, but it's probably not going to be the tool of choice for new companies and smaller companies. I really like the Angular 2, and by now it's probably Angular 4 syntax is really like, I just don't like how it looks, the the API they created, but that's just a personal thing. So yeah, we're still with Angular 1. I I really hope that I could devote the time to migrate to something else, but 
every time it comes up, I need to wear the product manager hat and say, the user doesn't care if it's Angular, React, or whatever. So let's focus on things that the user cares about. Yeah, I mean, it, it really doesn't matter too much until maybe you there are contributors that's like, I would love to contribute, but I'm not writing Angular, or it's really in the way of like evolving the product, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm sure that there are a few things that I can... Like, the aspect of attracting new contributors is definitely an issue here because many people will just stay away from Angular these days and will be bumped by that. And I can see some technical challenges that will be much easier, including the the plugin model and stuff like that, if we adopted something else. What would you pick if you could pick anything? It's a good question. It will be probably either React or Vue. Mm -hmm. I really, there are some things that I really like about Vue or whatever its name. <laughs> Vue, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, it's probably pronounced like Vue, but you, yeah. Anyway, V-U-E. So there are many concepts there that I really like, but it seems that most of the mind share is around React. And as an open source project, that's, I think it's important to adopt the more common technologies so it's easy for people to jump in and contribute instead of picking stuff that might be, make more sense I mean, from a technical point of view. Yeah, there's really that balance, isn't there? I mean, you definitely want to make it as easy as possible for contributors to contribute and extend it. Yeah, and in that sense, Angular was really a bad choice. I remember um, an instance where someone, like a co-worker there for me, wanted to add some feature, and I started to walk him through the things that he will need to understand to add it. And then after like two, three minutes, I said, you know what, never mind. I just implemented myself. It will take less <laughs> time than to explain it. On the other hand, there was some internal app that I wrote later on with React, and I wanted someone to help me with a specific component there. And he didn't even need to look at React's documentation. He figured out the API from the code that I already had in place. So it really reassured this feeling that I had that React is really has a really good learning curve. So even if someone not familiar with it, it's super easy to understand. I mean, it has other issues where it's like the ecosystem around it is a bit uh, complex at, at this uh, time. But yeah, I don't know. It will take time until we, I, I will have to make this decision again. So we'll see how things will shift until then. Yeah, maybe someday you can rewrite the front end. But for now... <laughs> There, there, there's more to do. So one, yeah, of the exactly. thi one of the things I wanted to talk to you, uh, make sure that we covered on the show is when you first started this project, it was an open source project. And then recently we talked about everything me and it's shutting down and that gave you a chance to say, okay, well, if I'm not doing that anymore, now what? And you decided to try to take Redash and make it a proper company as you talked about in the beginning, right? Yep. Yep, yep. I think there are a lot of people working on open source things and they're, you know, it's, it feels to me like the standard way to like level up off of open source stuff is to, all right, I've created something like, let's just say like Flask. I don't actually know how Armin Roenacher work, you know, works this angle, but let's suppose I create Flask. Flask is popular. So I try to do consulting for Flask projects. And that's fine, but I feel like in a lot of cases it doesn't work very well. You're still trading in your time for money, which is not you know always the best thing to be doing. So you said like you actually thought through the different business models, and right now you're basically offering, in addition to the free open source version, hosted Redash as a service, right? Yeah, that's correct. So do you want to talk about your thinking through those different business models and uh, whatnot, stuff like that? Sure, sure. About half a year ago, I did a uh, talk at a local meetup about what I learned from the experience of taking a pro, uh, an open source project and turning it into a company. And there have been three lessons. The first one is that if you want to be able to work on, on some open source project, like your project, don't start a company. <laughs> that was a mistake. Because, and it's like an obvious thing, starting a company has its own challenges and it has it, its own demands, and it's not easy. You have to learn about accounting and all sorts of stuff that is you're not trained in marketing, for example. Yeah, so there is that, but there is the whole thing of like creating a business, which is has nothing to do with creating a project. 
like or creating a product even like you have your open source project that's cool but it has nothing to do with creating a business around it and i know that i made mistakes some of them intentional around the business side of freedash because the reason i started the company was to make sure that freedash will stay here for the long term so basically the project doesn't serve the company like it's not that i'm building a company using the project i'm building the company for the project like i'm building the company to be able to work on the project for the long term obviously i'm also making it for my own self attribution reasons because like i always wanted to create a company the way i see that it should be but there is some balance where usually you would take you will invest more in the business itself i tipped more towards the project because that was the goal now in terms of business model luckily we can see a lot of open source companies these days and you can see different models they do many of them actually if you look into it they do all of them <laughs> so basically you can either like have some do a licensing or two versions like have some your community version and your enterprise version something like gitlab uh, yeah gitlab is doing so they have the their community gitlab version that anyone can download install and there's the enterprise version of gitlab and these days there are i think two flavors of their enterprise version which you can buy a license for and install them so that's one model there are the, there is the model of offering some professional services around your software and there is the model of offering a hosted version of your software which is something that gitlab is doing as well but it's not their main thing the project that i took inspiration most from was is sentry which is actually python as well and i exchanged a few emails with david kramer who was really generous with his time and shared some advice and what they're doing is that they have a saas offering which is exactly the same as their open source project when i started i decided to do practically the same thing to keep everything open source and offer it as a service as the saas offering and basically the idea is that anyone who doesn't want to manage his own installation of redash and have the hassle of like uptime and keeping up with the upgrades and all this stuff he can use the hosted version what i learned since then is it takes time to scale a saas business especially when it's not your only focus like i'm always like juggling between okay we have the open source version and i have some production issue with the saas and you need to prioritize and also like building a saas business again like at this point redash is good enough to keep just keep selling it like to focus on finding the market finding the market and blah 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 but because it's also open source it has to keep moving forward because no one likes a, like a stagnating open source project so there is this balance which is not that easy to maintain especially with limited resources so beside deciding like on this business model i also decided to keep the company bootstrapped and not to raise any money there were different reasons for that essentially it's just the thing that i felt most comfortable with this portion of talk python to me is brought to you by hired Hired is the platform for top Python developer jobs. Create your profile and instantly get access to thousands of companies who will compete to work with you. Take it from one of Hired's users who recently got a job and said, I had my first offer within four days and I ended up getting eight offers in total. I've worked with recruiters in the past, but they were pretty hit and miss. I tried LinkedIn, but I found Hired to be the best. I really like knowing the salary up front and privacy was also a huge seller for me. Well, that sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? But wait until you hear about the signing bonus. Everyone who accepts a job from Hired gets a $300 signing bonus. And as TalkPython listeners, it gets even sweeter. Use the link talkpython.fm slash Hired, and Hired will double the signing bonus to $600. Opportunity is knocking. Visit talkpython.fm slash Hired and answer the door. There have been a few local investors who've been really interested, and I even had funny thing that one of our SaaS users He had, we have an integration with Slack that you can share visualizations from Redash on Slack. And he has a Slack channel with his investors. So he started sharing with them KPIs and stuff like that from Redash 
in Slack. And so he, his investor saw it and he said like, hey, what's that? That looks cool. Can you connect me with the founder? I might want to invest, but I passed that opportunity. Yeah, that's a hard decision to make, right? But as soon as you take funding, the, the clock starts ticking for growth and other types of things that are maybe short term and not necessarily where you want to focus? Well, it's a long discussion like bootstrap versus VC and all, but essentially what I realized is that I prefer to keep it bootstrap. So let's just move in with it. It definitely puts many constraints on what you can do. Up to this day, I'm still working mostly alone on it, like full time. I'm the only employee at the company. I'm using some freelancers, but full time, I'm the only one. I am currently trying to hire another developer, so, but it takes time. So it's still only me, but hopefully soon there will be another person. So do you feel like uh, the having your open source project also powering a SaaS company, do you feel like Redash is better because of the exposure and experience you got running the SaaS company? Yeah, that's for sure. The hosted version of Redash is probably one of the largest deployments of Redish. And it allows me both to stress test it and to find weak points in terms of performance and stuff like that. But also it gives me visibility into how people use it. So as an open source project, you practically have no idea how people use your project, what they do with it, how they use it, what kind of connectors and all that. So you need to make decisions really blindly compared like, to a SaaS business where they have a lot of data that they can collect. Yeah, it's not like everything me, for example, which started this whole thing where you have all these stats coming in and now I'm sure you have like all sorts of usage stats on like features, how frequently they're used and the type of errors you run into. And you wouldn't get that if it was just clone it off GitHub and run the script. Yeah, exactly. And so this uh, as well improves the project itself because it allows to make more informed decisions. I remember... There was one instance where someone wanted to switch just some behavior. And it felt to me that what he proposed is not common enough. But then I ch checked the data and I realized that he's right. So it really, really helps to be able to see how people use it and to have more direct access to them and to be able to understand what they do with Redash. It has some downsides towards the open source project because there are things around the way, like the, the deployment story and stuff like that, that might be investing more into them if it was only a self-hosted solution. We still have quite an easy way to deploy Redash. Like I maintain images for Amazon and Google Cloud, and also there are Docker images. So it's not that hard to start using Redash. And in the last version, I even added some wizard that allows you to set up the user without having to use the CLI. That's eventually improving, but it could move faster if I w wasn't also working on the SaaS project. Yeah, it's easy to see it that way. But at the same time, the SaaS project lets you put all of your time into this open source project and not do like consulting for a bank where you're building forms over data type web apps. Yeah, exactly. And at the beginning, I've been doing some custom development, paid custom development for on top of Redash, but still like doing some sort of consulting work while over time I could focus more on the product itself. So so it definitely has its benefits. And I'm still like, it's a recurring thing, dilemma for, for me, like around whether I should invest more in the SaaS or should I find a business model around the self-hosted version? Because even today, there are much more users who use the open source version, the self-hosted one than ones who use the SaaS version. And there are people who even start with the SaaS and then like they use the trial of the SaaS, say, oh, that's cool. Let's move to the open source one for different reasons. Some of them just don't want to open their database to an external company. Others are just cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and I even compared the numbers with Sentry and they said that they see a better ratio between the open source users and the SaaS users. And I think that part of the reason is the kind of product I'm building where you really need to like give access to your data to another company and many people not feeling comfortable with that. So I always like it's a recurring dilemma of whether I should find either another business model or an additional business model 
where I can offer something to the self-hosted crowd. And the obvious thing here is just some kind of an enterprise edition. But my concern here is that once I start offering an enterprise edition, there are two problematic outcomes here. One is that usually enterprise clients, they not only buying software, they're also buying support, which means selling services. Right. What's your SLA and all of that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. And you start deviating into the world of selling hours instead of selling software. That's one issue. And another issue is that they have completely different demands than what the rest of the users need. And then there is the concern of turning Redish into Jira instead of keeping it as Trello. And this is like something that it's a slippery slope where you find yourself with a bloated product because of different bigger clients with weird needs. And today it's easier to ignore them because they're not paying you. But once most like huge chunk of your revenue comes from them, you need to be more attentive. So these concerns keep me on the SaaS model, but it's like a recurrent dilemma. And I hope that one day I will have a definitive answer here and I will know like, yeah, that's what we're sticking with. Yeah, it's it's not super straightforward, I can tell. But I think it's really great that that you're making it work on either path. And the SaaS one is definitely adding value to the world. So nice work. And I'm sure it's inspirational to a lot of people to hear it. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. All right. Well, I think we're going to probably have to leave it there more or less for Redash. So let me ask you two final questions before I let you out of here. When you're working on Redash and you open up an editor, a Python editor, what one is it? So until not long ago, it was Atom. But recently I started using Sublime again. So I guess it's both of them. And obviously with Vim mode enabled. Yeah, of course. Very nice. And what out of the 100,000 plus PyPI packages, what one do you think is notable that people maybe don't know of, but they should check out? So the first one is Peewee. P-E-E-W-E-E. Yeah, exactly. It's an ORM. Mm -hmm. It's a Python ORM. I think it's not... It should be much more popular than it is. I think it's the most Pythonic ORM. Yeah, exactly. I really don't understand how SQL Alchemy getting more mindshare than Peewee. It's really like a mystery to me because Peewee is much more Pythonic. And Redish been using Peewee up until like half a year ago when I decided to migrate to SQL Alchemy. And no offense to the SQL Alchemy people, but I think that was one of the biggest mistakes of 2016 for me. Yeah, I should have stayed with Peewee. How interesting. Yeah, you're right. The SQL Alchemy definitely gets a lot of the mind share. SQL Alchemy is great, but I do think also Peewee is, is quite cool. Basically, you give it Lambda expressions or generator expression type things, and it transforms that into the actual SQL query. I think that's glorious. Yeah, and it's just simple to use and fun. Yeah, exactly. And I also noticed that there's an extension sort of package that will convert it to an async IO variation. So you can basically create async coroutines and use PeeWee queries and await the queries, which is, that's just icing on the cake. That's nice. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it's very cool. So... Thanks for that. Those are awesome recommendations. Now, final call to action, like how do people check out Redash? How do they check out the hosted thing? What do you need from the community? Things like that. Go to redash.io and you have all the information there. It's super easy to start either if you go with the hosted version or even if you start with your own deployment. It's really a few minutes and you can start querying your data. And probably if you have a database, you, you need Redash. And contributions are always welcome. Like both code, but also documentation. Like this is something that we're not getting enough of. But yeah, any contribution is eventually welcomed. All right. Well, sounds good. It's definitely a cool project. Eric, thank you for sharing it with everyone. Thank you for inviting me. You bet. Bye. This has been another episode of Talk Python to Me. Today's guest has been Eric Framovich, and this episode has been sponsored by Intel and Hired. The Intel distribution for Python delivers the high-performance Intel C libraries built right into Python. Get close to 100 times better performance for certain functions when using NumPy, SciPy, and Scikit-Learn. Check them out at talkpython.fm slash intel. Hired wants to help you find your next big thing. Visit talkpython.fm slash hired to get five or more offers with salary and equity presented right up front and a special listener signing bonus of $600. 
Are you or your colleagues trying to learn Python? Well, be sure to visit training.talkpython.fm. We now have year-long course bundles and a couple of new classes released just this week. Have a look around. I'm sure you'll find a class you'll enjoy. Be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python. We should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes feed at slash iTunes, Google Play feed at slash play, and direct RSS feed at slash RSS on talkpython.fm. Our theme music is Developers, Developers, Developers by Corey Smith, who goes by Smix. Corey just recently started selling his tracks on iTunes, so I recommend you check it out at talkpython.fm slash music. You can browse his tracks he has for sale on iTunes and listen to the full-length version of the theme song. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Smix, let's get out of here. Stating with my voice, there's no norm that I can feel within. Haven't been sleeping, I've been using lots of rest. I'll pass the mic back to who rocked it best.